Hey, good morning, church family, and welcome to another online version of Living Hope Community Church. I don't know how many of these the, uh, electronic greetings that I've done, but it seems like it just kind of perpetually goes on and on and on and on, and we don't seem to be getting anywhere closer to the end of this coronavirus. I got to admit, I had a little bit of a panic session this week. When I look around and I see that we're still on lockdown in a lot of places, it looks like we're in a never-ending cycle of phase one, phase two, hope back to phase one, maybe phase three, nope, let's go to phase zero, followed by what the uh, disaster that we had with the unemployment office of sending hundreds of millions of dollars to Nigeria while a lot of our neighbors and our businesses are struggling just to get any kind of funds whatsoever, really hurt me this week. And I, I ended up texting Jeremy and, say, and Brock and a few of the others of the board and said, hey, when are we planning on opening up the church? And I want to give a special thanks to Jeremy because he, he really kind of put me in my place on this one. Because for the last three or four years that I've been doing announcements, one of the big things that I said was, the church isn't this wooden building that we meet in. It isn't this structure that we're at. And that I need to be careful that I'm not switching my spirituality or my, my faith and my plugging in in Jesus with the physical showing up of church that I need. If, if everything in my relationship of church is based on showing up every Sunday just to see people, I'm missing out on what the entire spirituality side of Jesus is and the, and the lessons that could be learned here. So I've really kind of focused, trying to focus on replugging in that way in this absence of time that we can meet in the absence of the time that we can be at church in the absence of the physical uh, counterparts of seeing everyone. I'm trying my best to try to plug back in to the spiritual side of it. And I think that's been a very healthy thing. So I'm encouraging all my friends, all my church family and everybody else out there to do the same thing. In this point of time where it seems like it just kind of <laughs> crazy seems to be the new normal, it's time that we focus on what our true foundations are of our faith. And that is my goal this week. And as I move forward, that being said, I miss everybody terribly. I miss the physical interactions. I miss the high fives. I miss the hugs and I miss the jokes. And when we finally get the church back open into a normal relationship again, you know, it's going to be absolute mayhem with seeing everybody. I think there's going to be a hug line going on for at least, you know, 30 minutes. So Jeremy may want to have a very short sermon that day. All right, my friends. I wish you all the best. Thank you for everything that you do out there. Keep the faith. Looking forward to seeing you at home again or back at our church again soon. Take care, friends.
This week, Allison Hurt came to me and I was so excited. She said, hey, I, God's given me this thought uh, based on some of the things we've been learning on. Is it okay if I share those? And I was like, oh, would you please? Because I know that the best learning happens in community and during the week, if you're anything like me, the message, when you hear it, that's where your journey just starts. And so most of the good stuff that we process happens through the week. So uh, we, she agreed to, to share that video with us for us all just to be invited to think more about it and just to know her better and to see God at work in her life. So thank you, Allison. We'll, get, we'll check that out now. might not be the house of Gucci or San Loren, but it is a local tailor shop. A Christian man owns this shop. They make beautiful clothing. But a week ago, all that changed, and they are 100% making face masks. We have made maybe about 3,000 so far, and as long as there are supplies that we can get a hold of, the markets have closed, we don't know how long we'll have access to these supplies, we will keep sewing round the clock face masks for our community. Jesus says, I have come that they may have life. And as missionaries, we have come to bring the gospel, the life, that good news, but also to help in the physical life and to make sure to the best of our ability, we can be an example to our community of wearing face masks and following the regulations of our government and helping others to do the same. We are so grateful for you who give so that we can continue to serve and to be with our church during these difficult days. Thank you. Good morning, Living Hope Church family. Before we dive in today, I wanna to talk about reopening Living Hope Community Church since it's definitely on our minds. The Living Hope Board is working to develop a plan for us to start meeting in person again as soon as is safe and possible. First off, I'm not a huge fan of calling it a reopen since you can't reopen something that never closed. Living Hope is a family of Christ seekers and followers who learn, live, and worship in community. You can't close that, so there. Out of love and a desire to protect others, we moved our gatherings online. One day, when we start meeting again in person, we will still be motivated by loving and protecting each other. As you know, there's a lot of political stuff going on regarding religious gatherings. We are not ignorant, uninvolved, or fearful of those, but we are not driven by them either. We are still all about deepening faith, finding hope, and loving Jesus. Things move so quickly in our current landscape, it feels impossible to keep up, but our focus and direction has not shifted one bit. I want everything we do and the motives behind them to be pleasing to God. Okay, while we're working on that plan and seeking God's guidance on timing, I'd like to ask a few things of you, if I may. First, please pray for us. We have no wisdom in ourselves, so we fully rely on God to pour out His wisdom on us. Second, be patient. We will probably mess this up. 
I wish we could predict how things will turn out and crush it, but since we can't, we'll try to make the best worst decision possible at the time, then clean up, learn, and adjust. These are not easy decisions. We are a very diverse church family and governing board. It's beautiful, fragile, and well worth protecting. Third, keep interacting with our online gatherings. Keep worshiping in your homes together. It's one of the most important things we do all week. I know meeting online isn't optimal, but it's what we've got right now. So dive in, make it fun and meaningful. I'm so grateful for how you all keep sending in videos, scriptures, photos, and artwork. I love the comment section banter, the encouragement, the greeting. You guys are great at making lemonade, so thank you. Ooh, there's another thing moving so fast I can hardly keep up with that I wanted to update you guys on. Great Commission Day. Our last day to join the rest of the U.S. Alliance churches is June 28th. We'll get to hear more stories of what God is up to around the world, and I told you about the donors who sent forth a challenge for us, then we matched it, then they upped it again. Guess what? We matched them again, and then we kept going. Nationally, we are already at, you ready for this? 1,273,335 dollars and 44 cents. That's right, we're counting pennies. And plenty of churches like us haven't even sent in their contribution yet. That's so awesome. I'm so proud of how we're giving faithfully to support the spreading of the gospel of Jesus through our international workers during difficult times. You are cordially invited to join the party by sending a check to the church or through our website at WenatcheeLivingHope.com. Either way, please designate your giving to CMA Missions so that 100% of it will go directly to the Great Commission Fund. And speaking of awesome, Brad sent in some photos of roses in bloom. Check these out. Gorgeous. Hey, do you have something growing in your garden or a potted plant, fruits or veggies, something that you're into? I'd love to see them and share them if that's all right with you. Just snap a photo and send it my way when you get a chance. And now, on to our message. I have a friend in military intelligence and we used to go hiking in the early morning. People in those kinds of jobs can't really talk about their work, but since it's such a large part of our lives, I would ask how things were going in very broad terms and leave it at that. I was wanting to connect with a friend, not get information. I remember one day he seemed very up. I asked if things were going well at work and he said things were going extremely well. I said, look, I don't answer anything that would even be remotely out of bounds, but..." What does that even mean in your light of work? He said, well, you can go years tracking people of interest. It can be really tough to get solid information, and often you're not sure if the intel you're gathering is worth the time, expense, and manpower to gather, or if it will ever really get used in a way that makes a difference. But every so often, someone from high up asks about intel you've been working hard at for a long time. They ask you very direct questions, and you're able to give them solid answers. They act on the intel you give them, and lives are saved. It's a great day at work when your intel makes the world a safer place. Whoa! Okay, that sounds like it would be satisfying. So I said, you had a good day? He got this gratified smile on his face and said, oh yeah. You'll hear about this one on all the news channels for sure. Sure enough, I did. Everyone did. No denying the world was a safer place that day. Pretty awesome. I also asked him what it means to have a bad day, and he said it's really tough when you've got years worth of work, then you suddenly get new orders and just drop all of it. Yeah, ouch, I can only imagine. Most people get frustrated when they wash their car and it rains. We're in chapter 4 of Jonah today, and I gotta confess, before looking into this more closely, I bagged on Jonah pretty hard, and for good reason. I mean, he goes on a pretty serious wine fest here. But on closer inspection, his words don't seem quite as overly dramatic as I had supposed them to be. After all, 
He just had a very bad day at work. The mission he thought he was sent to accomplish got pulled out from under him when new orders came in. Grab your Bible and turn to Jonah chapter 4. Last week we looked at the word demolished that was used for what God was going to do to Nineveh and we saw this word has a sense of total transformation. God was saying through Jonah that he was going to do such a radical work in Nineveh that you would hardly recognize it for what it was before. That transformation could come by the city being leveled, perhaps Sodom and Gomorrah style with fire raining down, or by its people turning completely from their murderous ways. I don't think Jonah caught that part. He clearly wanted to hold God to only the disastrous definition of that word. Let's read Jonah 4 together, right after the part where Yahweh does not destroy the city, and look at how Jonah responds. Jonah 4, 1. But Jonah was greatly displeased and became furious. If you've got something different in the translation you're reading, go ahead and drop it in the chat section if you don't mind. Comparing translations can help us get a fuller understanding of a passage. Okay, greatly displeased is pretty light compared to the Hebrew. In the Hebrew, it reads, it was evil to Jonah, or a great evil. This word evil is the same word used in two other places in this book. First, it's used in chapter 1, verse 2, where God is talking about Nineveh and says, get up, go to the great city, city of Nineveh and preach against it because their wickedness has confronted me. Hmm. It's also the same word used by the ruler of Nineveh in chapter 3, verse 8, when he commands everyone to turn from his evil ways and from the violence he's doing. So we've got Yahweh, the ruler of Nineveh, and Jonah all agreeing on the same word for Nineveh, evil. Not a word you throw around casually. He felt a righteous and godly anger toward Nineveh. Psalm 97.10 says, You who love the Lord hate evil. Yep, that's the same word in Hebrew too. Pretty much every ancient artifact in existence today from the Assyrian region bears truly gruesome images of what they did to their enemies. Hmm, maybe Jonah isn't so out of line here. Let's go on to verse 2. He prayed to the Lord, Please, Lord, isn't this what I said while I was still in my own country? That's why I fled toward Tarshish in the first place. I know, I knew that you are a merciful and compassionate God, slow to become angry, rich in faithful love, and one who relents from sending disaster. We know the whole story, but for the first time reader, this is a plot reveal. Before this point, the writer did not tell us why Jonah was acting so out of character for a prophet when he first rebelled, and now, for the first time, his reasons are made clear. In verse 3, he says, And now, Lord, please take my life from me, for it's better for me to die than to live. When I first read this, I just pictured Jonah throwing a tantrum here, but now, I'm not so sure. By our cultural standards, it might be like if he was on a mission to confront the Taliban post 9-11. The Ninevites were brutal people by everyone's standards. They were in a reign of terror with no signs of stopping. This was not history for Israel. Can you imagine his buddies in the temple or his neighbors back home? He was a prophet with a doomsday message to deliver for heaven's sake. Literally for heaven's sake. Then he gets back home and people ask, how'd it go? Did you get him? He can't face all those people. How in the world is he going to tell them nothing happened, or worse yet, that God forgave them? What are the papers going to run with? Can you imagine the backlash on social media? He can't go home now, and he certainly doesn't want to stay in Nineveh. This is a bad day at work for him. All that dramatic buildup, then new orders come in, and he's just supposed to drop it all and readjust. So God, in his gentle but direct way, asks Nona a wonderful question in verse 4. The Lord asked, Is it right for you to be angry? 
This is again an echo of something spoken before. In Hebrew, this verse says, does it rightly burn to you? Referring to something that makes you so mad it burns you up. That same expression is used in Jonah 3.9 when the king says, who knows? God may turn and relent. He may turn from his burning anger so that we will not perish. That verse actually has a literal reference to the nose burning like those cartoons of a bull who's about to charge. We even have an emoji for this. So before we had a word parallel of God and Jonah's view of Nineveh as of horribly evil, and now we have another parallel of their burning anger. Jonah is not chastised for being angry. It's almost as if God is telling Jonah, I know how you feel. I can tell you're really angry. I get it. But why are you angry? What a great question for you and I to bring before the Lord and ourselves when we're angry. Is it good that I'm angry right now? Instead of answering God, Jonah goes off by himself outside the city and hopes to watch it burn. In the heat of the moment, I'm sure it would have been tough for Jonah to recognize that if God just finished off everyone who rebelled against him, Jonah would have been a goner back in chapter 1 when he was thrown overboard. Grace should have changed him, softened him. It should soften me too. When I, by the nudging of the Spirit, take my anger outside of myself and look at it with God, it looks different. When I look at my right to anger and demands for justice against the backdrop of the cross, the waves start to die down, and I am once again facing what it is I'm truly mad about. Instead of just accepting anger whenever it comes my way, or denying it altogether, stuffing it down, there's a third option presented here. We can examine it truthfully, inviting God to help us, and then decide what we want to do with it. I'll list a few ways Jonah expressed his anger. Try to remember the one you relate to most closely so you can share it with your discussion group. Don't overthink it. We're just relating to one another in humility without fear of being judged and without judging others. Deal? Okay. First, the burster. Jonah responded with sudden bursts of anger. Words came flying out of his mouth he wish he hadn't said. These can be loud or soft. Second. The powder. Jonah went off by himself. Nothing wrong with taking time away, especially if you've got steam coming out your nose. But a good pout is meant to push people away and punish them. Third, the spiraler. Jonah sent himself spiraling into a pit of despair until he was convinced himself that dying was the best option. The ammo hoarder. Jonah didn't let his anger for Nineveh subside, even after God's did. Sometimes, instead of looking in anger, we store up offenses like a weapons cache so we can unload it all at once, overwhelming someone who hurts us with an arsenal of things they did wrong. The deputy. Upset with God's decision to show mercy, Jonah wanted to insist on God's judgment even after God had dropped it. We can sometimes deputize ourselves and champion various issues, trying to hold other ca others accountable to standards we define for them. Those are just a few of my favorites to get thoughts and conversations flowing, but they may not fit you well. That's fine. Feel free to describe your anger responses in your own words. Now the good part. Hold those responses out and examine them in light of God's grace and love toward you. How does God's grace and truth put your anger in submission to him instead of letting it run you around? What truths and realities can you remind yourself of? Never underestimate the power of scripture here. I'll start with a few, but feel free to load each other up with encouragement this morning. 1 Timothy 1.15 here, Paul reminds himself and others that he's in desperate need of constant grace and has been forgiven much when he says he is the chief of sinners. In 1 Peter 5, 7, he says, 
Cast all your cares on him, for he cares for you. Okay, your father is not indifferent, uncaring, nor powerless. 2 Corinthians 3.18 says that we are all in the process of becoming more like Christ. That lets me give him space to work in me and others and relieves me of the responsibility to be the Holy Spirit in someone else's life. Proverbs 20.22 tells us we don't have to go out and take revenge because God is going to definitively take care of all things related to justice. Hopefully those will get you going, but the best ones are the ones you find on your own. Feel free to share those on our Faith Life page if you like. By the way, if any particular verse ever catches your attention, you want to find out if there are other verses that address a similar theme, try a tool called a cross-reference. I'll put a link to one in the video description below, which is free. And now may God's presence be felt in your homes and in your conversations. Have a fantastic week. Bye.